Hello and welcome to the fourth part in a complete retrospective on the new Super Mario series supported by patrons such as Abby Knudsen, Kit Kat, Ken Colton, and Jeffrey Long. If you have not seen the previous three videos, there will be a link to the playlist in the description below. And for everyone else, let's get back to it. Nintendo fans were excited that Nintendo was finally going to release their first ever HD system. And who better to show us the power of this new console than Mario himself? When it comes to Nintendo consoles, it's typically the Mario Bros that break the ice and show us what this new console is all about. Super Mario World, a launch title for the Super Nintendo, was a fantastic game and an even better launch title to show the power of the Super Nintendo. Mario 64, the launch title for the Nintendo 64, was as well another great game. So great in fact, it paved the way for all 3D platformers to come. So fast forwarding to Mario U, it is immediately apparent why many were unimpressed. People were like, so this is the game that's going to kick off Nintendo's first ever HD system? It has a crisp HD resolution, sure, but honestly, I am not that convinced this looks even that much better than Mario Brothers on the Wii. In fact, if you were to run both of these games in HD, I would not blame you for mistaking one for the other. I should make a brief mention that this game started out as a game called New Super Mario Brothers Me, which was little more than a tech demo to show off the Wii U's gamepad before eventually becoming the game we all know today. Despite having a three-year development, not a whole lot else changed. It was on a brand new console, sure, but the closest Mario U gets to taking advantage of the new hardware is being able to tap the screen and seeing a block appear. Even in an interview, Awada expressed concern about making sure this one really felt different since New Super Mario 2 had just come out. But the developers were adamant that this would be the thing that really distinguishes this game from the others. This key feature, it was simply just so memorable, so inseparable from the title's identity that, uh, um, they flat out got rid of it in the Switch port. Well, so much for being a key feature. And if you're of the mindset that this feature couldn't have possibly been on another console, then you should go tell that to the Murphy gimmick of Rayman Legends. Something that was specifically designed for the gamepad, but was still included in other ports. This is a bit of a hot take, but I believe new Super Mario Bros. U is partially to blame for the failure of the Wii U. Launch titles play a pivotal role in the success of a console's first few years. If you need further proof of this, just look back at the rocky start of the PS3. Or conversely, the Nintendo Switch, a console that did exceedingly well at launch due to just one great game alone. Once again, context is important. But as always, I think it's only fair to look at Mario U on its own merits. An underwhelming game isn't always synonymous with a bad game. So let's take a look. The Mario Bros, Princess Peach, and two random toads again are all hanging out eating cake and drinking tea, all partaking in a friendly discussion as to why they still don't have any security. Hey, wouldn't it be funny if Bowser broke in again? Yeah! Good thing that would happen! Oh no, it happened. This time, instead of capturing the princess, Bowser grabs our heroes and throws them out. So while the objective is still to save the princess, this time around, you travel back to her castle instead of Bowser's. Given the plot revolves around Mario being thrown out of the Mushroom Kingdom and making the journey back, I was hoping there would be an excuse to finally mix things up in terms of progression. You know, like a role reversal of sorts in the order of worlds you explore. Like maybe you would start out in the lava world and then by the end of the game you finish off in the grassland. But nope, it's the same exact themes once again in the same exact order. Yeah, this is the fourth new Super Mario and we're still using the whole grassland, desert, snow world, etc. But hey, there's at least one difference. Every world has like food names now for some reason. It doesn't translate to anything in the levels themselves unfortunately. World 2 gave me some false hope being called Layer Cake Desert. I mean even the overworld had giant frosted cakes. The levels themselves however, just basic desert levels again. And before I get several comments about this, yes, Mario World did have a similar issue. However, I don't believe doing the same thing twice suddenly makes it okay. If anything, I think the opposite is true. At least you see the gradual transformation from a pleasant castle in the green field to one surrounded by lava. By the time your adventure comes to an end, the castle is completely infested in evil. That's what evil looks like. 
As for the layout of the world itself, it's an actual world. Taking a page from Super Mario World, we have one giant conjoined world, instead of a bunch of individual areas you select from a menu. Pretty damn big too. I think I'd still have to give the upper hand to the overworld in Mario World though. The progression in that game seemed a lot more natural, whereas in Mario U, it is very clear where one theme ends and another one begins. The worst offender is the transition to the desert world to the ice world. No joke, you're in a scorching hot desert and after climbing a small ladder, you're in a freezing tundra. Also missing is a star road equivalent, which tied the map together nicely in world. In Mario U, we instead have a bunch of pipes that launch you everywhere and… eh, it works. Just feels sort of uninspired. There is a star world of sorts here, but that's just a post-game world 9 similar to what we saw in Wii and 3DS. Although I do think the new sprawling overworld is a great set piece, and would likely make for a cool looking poster for your room or something. How it's all laid out feels disjointed in practicality. Likewise from Mario World, we see the return of Baby Yoshis which behave a bit differently from how we originally saw them in that game. Instead of feeding them so they can grow into a big Yoshi, the ones in Mario U, they never grow. You can still use them to eat enemies. And the absence of their evolution is likely to put a bigger spotlight on their new abilities. They even sing along to the current music, which is pretty adorable. Oh and get this, there are normal Yoshis here that you still can't take out of the respective levels. But these baby Yoshis you have to carry, these, you can take out of the levels. Okay, so if the concern was to restrict Yoshi to specific levels to make the most out of him, then let me ask a perfectly reasonable question. WHY THE HELL CAN'T YOU KEEP THE NORMAL YOSHIS IF YOU CAN HOLD ON TO THE BABY ONES?! Did they realize how little sense this made when adding the babies? Anyways, the blue baby Yoshi can spit out bubbles to trap enemies, the pink one can inflate itself to float upward, and the gold Yoshi will provide light in dark areas. And you know what a light emitting Yoshi means? That's right, those lovely darkness levels are back. They even brought back my favorite, underwater darkness levels. Oh boy, it's like scraping your knee in the same exact spot as last time and shoving even more salt in there. Mario U only has one new power-up this time, that being the flying scroll suit. It allows you to glide and sprout upwards by shaking the remote. A single new power-up this time might sound pretty lame, and yeah I suppose it is, but Mario U still manages to have the most power-ups in the entire series. This is thanks to the extra world containing both the penguin suit and propeller suit. I genuinely love how this is handled too, because just like the example I gave in Wii when talking about Mario 3's frog suit, they have managed to take these two power-ups that used to be fairly common, and make them feel extremely valuable by holding their hand until the very end. You can only get these in World 9. This may seem insignificant, but it's fascinating how valuable they've made both of these suits simply by restricting them to the end of the game. My jaw literally dropped when I went into the item house expecting the typical mushroom and star, but instead was greeted with two items I didn't even know were in the game. The additional perk to this design choice is that it addresses a problem I had in Wii, which was the redundancy of having both an ice flower and an objectively better power-up that could also shoot ice. Much like how Mario 3 justified having both the raccoon leaf and the tanuki suit in the same game by limiting the use of the tanuki suit to a finite number, it is likewise justified in Mario U since the penguin suit is extremely rare. In Mario U, you cannot get them in the basic overworld mushroom houses or just replay a level that had the suit like you could in Mario Wii. Again, these suits are only in the World 9 mushroom houses, a minor addition, but a respectable one. Mario Brothers Wii U introduces a fair number of baddies as well. Time for the roll call. Dragon Eels, Pink Walruses, Deformed Goombas, Robofish, Silly Putty Squirrels, and yes, that purple rascal Nabbit. Nabbit will randomly appear in select levels, with a bag of stolen goodies with him. If you select a level that Nabbit is in, you have a chance to catch him for a pea acorn, a variation of the flying squirrel suit that lets you fly indefinitely. You know, kind of like the pea wing in Mario 3. Presentation wise, things are good. Simple, but good. The complete tone of Mario U and its worlds are less sterile than Mario Bros on Wii. On the Wii version, things were nice and clean, but not a lot was going on. But here in the Wii U version, there's a lot more going on in the background, a bigger variety of platforms, and in general, better use of color. Speaking for myself here, but I prefer the vibrant neon colors of New Super Mario Bros 2 because I think it lends itself better to an environment that feels more fun, for lack of a better word. But Mario U still has a great art
art style all the same. Music wise, eh. Once again, we have most of the Wii songs here. There are a few new ones, but otherwise, the desert music is the same, the beach music is the same, the cave music is the same, the jungle music is the same. It's lazy, but it's what you'd expect by now. That aside, things are sounding pretty alright so far. There's more new stuff than before, a giant world to explore, that just rhymed, baby Yoshis, but as I'm sure you've caught on by now, I have a huge obsession with the level designs themselves. So how does Mario U fare in that respect? At first, I thought better. Compared to the Wii, the first couple of worlds are more condensed and thought out. Which overall, I'd say is better, but this change also makes multiplayer less manageable. Mario U strikes a weird in-between because if you're playing single player, the level designs still don't feel quite as distinct as the handheld entries. But since the levels aren't as open as Wii, multiplayer in a large group doesn't work as well. Honestly, I'd say Mario U is a two, maybe three player game. First impressions were good though. It wasn't until I completed the game and looked back, did I realize I retained next to nothing playing Mario U. I tried to think about what levels I remembered. I remember a level where you climb a beanstalk. There's a secret water level that's pretty cool, since it actually strays away from all the NSMB presets we're typically used to seeing. So brownie points for that. Lastly, I remember that one stage that looks like a Van Gogh painting. I wish they did more inspired stuff like this more often, but yeah, it's only done in this one stage. And as far as I remember, I think that's about it. I might have been harsh on the Wii, but for Christ's sake, at least the Wii version had a decent amount of levels I remembered. Don't get me wrong. There is a decent amount of stuff I didn't mention yet that I do remember from Mario U, but the reason I didn't mention them is because they are all repeats of stuff we have already seen. We had an auto scroller of pair beetles, so you has a level of pair beetles. We had an icicle cave, so you had an icicle cave. We had a level where you keep enemies off your raft, so you had a level where you keep enemies off your raft. Mario We had a sky level of giant fuzzies on rails, so you has a look, you get the point. The contrast between Mario U and New Super Mario 2 is unbelievable. Here we have a game that added twice as much as NSMB 2 does, and has half as many new ideas. In a vacuum of space, I think I would say Mario U has better level design over the Wii version overall, but it's hard to really give any sort of credit to Wii U when Mario Wii did all of this first. Not to mention, Wii U may have more variety, but Mario Bros. Wii had a greater fun factor. Both of these games have their stinkers, but I found there were more levels in Mario U I flat out didn't like. I mean either that, or my tolerance has dropped due to playing hours on end of these games back to back. Whatever the case, an example of a level I just did not care for was that vertical castle elevator from World 8. Again, here's another idea ripped straight from the Wii, but the Wii version did it so much better. Having a castle take place outdoors was way more refreshing than the 100th fire castle for one, and the moving bullet bills were much more of a dynamic challenge in the stationary electrical lines. I was originally really excited to play Mario U. I did remember it being better, but the longer the game went on, the more I had to critique. I suppose you could say it's different in that regard. The Wii version got better as it went on, and Wii U got worse. If you need additional examples that they were running out of steam, then look no further than the star coins of this game. Mario U is not only formulaic with its star coins, but in many instances, arguably unfair. There were a couple times like here in World 2, where I would play a stage over and over looking for that last missing star coin just to find out the solution was a single invisible block placed in the butt fuck of nowhere. I was somehow expected to find. Having the star coin hiding behind a random hidden block is not a clever way to hide a collectible. Because when people cave in and finally look it up online, they're not gonna go, oh duh, why didn't I think of that? Their response is going to be something more along the lines of, are you fucking kidding me with this? In the DS game, there may have been a cryptic secret here and there, but there was always something giving you a slight hint. Using the example from when we were talking about Mario Brothers on DS, the first fortress in that game has a secret where you have to go off screen to find it, but in the spot it's discovered. This block right here has a different movement pattern from the rest. Again, it's ambiguous, but it's something. Meanwhile, Mario you has a secret where you need to run back into a solid wall, and then duck and slide to reveal a pipe. Who the f would even think to do that? Way too many of the star coins in this game, or even just secrets in general, are behind hidden walls. There are other ways to hide a secret than to just put it behind a fake wall. In fact, Mario Bros. DS doesn't have any fake walls, and I far from 100%ed that game when I replayed it. A perfect example that there can be well hidden star coins, without resorting to this tactic, is the last pipe here in the fourth castle. Many people will likely not catch it, but anyone keeping a perceptive eye out will notice it. There are many ways you can hide a star coin, but several secrets in Mario U are so aggravating because instead of thinking of something clever, they resort to one of three categories. One, some random invisible block you need to find. Two, running through a fake wall. Or three, 
purposely locking the camera so you're unable to find a star coin or secret in plain sight. I don't think any of these three methods are inherently bad, but when the game is constantly relying on these three cheap tricks over and over again, it discourages the collection aspect altogether. All the new stuff may be nice, but when the levels are this bankrupt for creativity, it's going to take a lot more than some baby Yoshis and one new power-up to actually feel, you know, <coughs> because outside some new modes, and a new control method I'll get into shortly, that really is just about it. The world themes are the same, most of the music is the same, the playable characters are the same, the bosses are the Koopalings again, the final fight against Bowser is underwhelming at best, and every mini tower boss fight is a boom boom. The only exception to that is one fight with Kimmick, which was also a fight from Wii. I know the other games are just as guilty for a lot of these things, but this is the fourth damn game. I don't think it's selfish of me, or anyone else for that matter, to expect a little something more. Outside the increased resolution, did Nintendo do anything with the new hardware? <sighs> yes, boost mode. You know, that, th that thing I was talking about earlier, you know, the mode where you tap the gamepad to make platforms. For fuck's sake, even Murphy, the only bad part of Rayman Legends, was better than this. Nobody wants to be the guy on the gamepad. You want to actually play. I don't know if Nintendo thought people would actually be into this or what, but no one I know cares about this sort of thing. I mean, really, do you want to be the person poking a gamepad or one of the people actually playing the damn game? This is essentially the little sibling mode. Do you have parents that make you play your games with your little siblings? Well, then make them use the gamepad. I want to play, I want to play. Oh, you do? Well, all right, here you go. You can be the platform placer guy. Maybe I'm being way too harsh on Mario Brothers U. So let's end this on a good note. The extra modes. Coin battle, boost rush, and last but certainly not least, challenge mode. And it's well worthy of that title. Coin battle is the same as it was from Wii. Not a personal favorite, but it's fun enough. If they were to bring back any of the modes from Wii, I'm just glad it wasn't free for all. I do like the tally up at the end they added. It breaks down who got what coins through what methods. There is even some added fanfare. It makes the mode feel a lot more substantial than in Wii, where it seemed like a last minute addition. Boost Rush is a cooperative mode where you and some friends try to beat a level as fast as you can. The catch is that the screen scrolls automatically, and to speed it up, you collect coins. A cool idea, and it's executed well. The last mode, which I personally think is downplayed given how fun it is, is the challenge mode. If you're like me, and think these games are way too easy, then you will love this mode. It's categorized into Time Attack, Coin Collection, 1-Up Rally, Special, and Boost Mode. Time Attack sees you trying to reach the flagpole as quickly as possible. Some of these challenges are legit hard if you're going for the gold ranking. If you are not continually running right the entire level, you are not getting gold. Coin collection is all about completing the stage while getting either as many or as few coins as possible. 1-Up Rally centers on you defeating as many enemies as possible to rack up a collection of 1-Ups. Special is a variety of challenges, such as beating an entire level without using any snake blocks. However, some of these seem out of place, like the Graceful Glide mission for example. In this mission, you have to stomp on as many enemies as possible to rack up 1-Ups. I don't know, shouldn't that just have been in the 1-Up Rally section? Finally, there's the boost mode, which is eh. These are a collection of stages where the person on the gamepad has to help the person playing on the TV by placing a bunch of platforms everywhere. Boost mode aside, most of these challenges are a ton of fun and provide some of the most difficult, if not the most difficult, challenges you'll ever see in a Mario game. Coming from the guy who has been grousing about all of these games being way too easy for the duration of this retrospective, some of these challenges gave me a pretty rough time. Here I was thinking I was pretty good, but god damn. When I started scripting this entry for New Super Mario Bros. U, I was sincerely shocked how negative it was. The biggest revelation I had while playing was, geez, maybe I was too harsh on the Wii. And I'm not even saying this is a bad game. I had a really fun time playing through it. Definitely was never in a bad mood or anything, but I suppose that's just what happens when you play nothing but New Super Mario games for an entire month. If you didn't keep up with this series, then Mario U would probably seem like the best one, because it takes a little bit from each of the previous three installments. At the end of the 
the day. It is a good game, but we, the consumers, deserved better. And the Wii U definitely deserved better. With a launch title like New Super Mario Bros. U, the poor thing hardly stood a chance. If this is your favorite NSMB game, I don't want you to feel bad for my own disposition, because I do recognize what it does well. If you like the game, then please continue to like it. As for me, I had fun. Nonetheless, I personally don't think it has enough of an identity to stand out. Whether you liked it or not, people were just done. Outright. We all had fun with at least one of these games, but they are all just too similar to be invested in the future of the series. Especially if their next game was... DLC. Ugh. I am so freaking burnt out on these games, alright? I am mentally done. But I need to finish what I started. It's time we talk about the last game in the series. New Super Luigi U. There is no way a game this late in the series could possibly feel any different. R right? Well, I guess we'll find out in the last part of this retrospective. When we take a look at New Super Luigi U. Let's hope for the best. Hey, thanks for watching! This video is patron supported by people such as John Hancock, Anton Anything, Amanda Guth, Rami Batter, Kit Kat, Blake Dog 72 Miles Mann, Aiden Ross, Ken Colton, King Cosmic, Jeffrey Long, Cashinator, Praetorian Mars, and Abby Knutson. I hope you will join me next time in the fifth and final video in this retrospective, but until then, thanks again for watching, and have a good one.